right, so I had a commenter send me a email, and uh, it's not the first time we've had a commenter inspire to make a video, and I thought it would be great before the Christmas break to do a video that focuses on different improvements you could be making and study strategies you can have. So I'm going to show one of my games, and as we're going through the game, I'm going to talk about uh, some of these studying strategies from things that you could be doing on openings, middle games, and end games. But uh, just like in my book, uh, Become a Chess Champion, um, I believe that everything that you're doing when you're trying to learn something, not just in the short term, like short term memory, like drilling right before a game, but in the long term requires an active learning approach. You have to be actively involved. You have to be actively asking questions. You have to be trying to figure something out. If you're not doing that, you're trying to memorize, and it's not going to stick. So let's go ahead and start getting into this game a little bit. And already, um, I'll put context in. Uh, like I'm playing against a 2300-rated player on chess.com in three-minute chess. And... I, I like to mess around in my openings, and I decided to play queen a4 here. And moves like this that directly take away from somebody else's opening and their structure that they're wanting to get to, like clearly this person wanted to play a slot. I play this on move two, and it messes them up. Most of the time they already have to think or play a structure that they're not comfortable with. So if you don't know a secondary structure here, you're already going to be in a situation where you have to think every single move and you're worse. So when working on your openings, like I feel that you should go through, say you're playing white, and in my case, I started off with 1c4. You're going to need to go through and research, and there's great websites for this, like chessgames.com or leechess.org, which has a free database, I would say, in equal breadth to Chessbase. You can go in leechess, and there are other videos showing how to do this in the Palm Beach Chess channel. And you need to look up every single move that can be played against 1c4. And you develop a repertoire for white. And against c6, my secondary line is to play queen a4. And I like playing it in blitz because it confuses my opponent. Because they can't play d5, their normal move. So how to go about studying openings? Once you have that set repertoire, and if you don't want to do the research yourself, or you're not confident in your ability to do it, you get a strong player to build the research for you, like I do for my students, or you find repertoire books. And you can take that book, and most of the time the books are old, outdated by the time they're even published, and you can put in key games, build your own database, and then use the engine as well as the database in leechess.org to build out and make improvements to the book. Everybody in the class following so far? So that, that's a great way to, to analyze the openings. So let's move on a little into the game. And I don't really do anything special here. We end up getting an old Indian structure. And typically in the old Indian, you're going to see like knight bd7, b6, bishop b7, a6. And black's, black's chilling. He's got a reasonable position, nothing to see here. This is the type of position I wanted when I played queen a4 on move two. It's just a game, and I don't know that my opponent has any experience or knowledge in how to play this, or the intricacies of the position. So he plays bishop f5, and instead of playing d4, which is typical, because then he could play e4, I just go d3. Knight bd7, e4, and I've defined the pawn structure. So there are multiple ways to study the middle game in order to get better in chess. And one way is to make sure that your openings have linear ideas. So when designing an opening repertoire, say if you're playing the King's Indian defense, it's your favorite opening, you love playing it with black. Playing structures that are similar with white, with similar ideas, is going to create a faster learning curve. That's why with a lot of my students, if they're playing, for instance, the London system, I'm going to pair the Slav with it. Because you're a move down in a London system, typically in a Slav. 
With the French players, I'm pairing it with a Queen's Gambit. You're having a similar pawn structure in all of your games, making it easier to learn. So one of the ways to get really strong in middle games is to make sure you understand the transpositions. So I like to find great players. So for instance, one great player that I, I enjoy studying is uh, Grandmaster Verusian Akobian. And he has a linear repertoire on both sides of the board. With white, you're going to typically see pawn structures that he has with d4, c4, and e3. And with black, he's playing e6, d5, and c5. So when you're taking a look at his games, it's one of those things that almost all of his games are going to have the same type of ideas. It's going to be linear in path. So you find a player who plays the openings that you're interested in, and you look at their games in volume. And there's two different schools of thought on this. You can play solitaire chess, like you can hide the moves and try to guess and try to treat it like it's an actual game. You let their opponent make a move, and then you try to figure out what they did. Then you reveal the move to yourself and see what they did. Does that make sense to everybody playing solitaire chess? And that's the old school way of studying. Um, like when I talked to Grandmaster Yuri Shulman, a former U.S. champion, when I was 1900 and attending the Emory Castle chess camp, that was the advice he gave to me. He said, go through one game and just spend like three hours going through it and really try to get every ounce of knowledge you can out of that one game. And you'll remember it forever because it's just like you played it. And then, like, I would say when he did that activity, he's going to get 99% effectiveness out of his game when he's doing it. But I never had the stomach to do that or the patience. The only time I can play a game for four hours like that is if I'm actually playing the game. So I would say a more modern practice is to go through games in volume. I'm just going to go through tons and tons of games that start after a certain opening position to get an understanding of it. And they're all going to be Grandmaster games. I'm just going to go one after the other over and over and over and over and over. And I'm not going to have a ton of retention. But if I can remember 5% or get that one key idea in each game that I'm looking at, then I would say in four hours of looking at games versus four hours of looking at one game, I would say potentially I have more recall. But what I will say about Grandmaster Shulman is that we played a game at camp where they asked the instructors the 50 most important chess games in history and the 50 most important moves in chess history. And Shulman was able to dictate the majority of those games and moves off the top of his head. So when he studied a game, he was studying it as if he played it himself to remember it. I personally cannot do that. Okay, so understand those differences in studying, and I like to share from my personal experience from working with grandmasters different things that I've learned or been told. So studying the middle games, that's one method. Actually studying the typical positions to try to find plans. The other method is studying tactic tactics and tactical awareness. And I'm a firm believer, um, I believe it was, in, it was in Pump Up Your Rating by Axel Smith. He talks about the woodpecker method. And most people, when they're studying tactics, they get on a tactics trainer that randomly generates problems. Uh, the woodpecker method is, imagine how Spider-Man has spider sense, like when something's about to go down. The woodpecker method trains you to look at the same patterns over and over and over and over and over because repetition is mastery. Think about how we learn language. Like when you take Spanish class, you have to say the same terms over and over and over every single day. When a baby is learning language, it's repetition. Repetition is mastery. It's the first step. So what's recommended by the Woodpecker Method is you take a book, a tactics book, a simple tactics book. We're talking like one and two movers. And every day, you set a chess clock. You give yourself an hour and you go through as much of that book as you can. So a great book that I like to do with this activity is Susan Polgar's Tactics for Champions because it hits a number of different tactical areas and it's focused in the chapter on specific types of tactics. So I, when I was at my peak of studying doing the Woodpecker Method, it's like 850 problems in that book. I could go through the entire book in an hour. And once, it, it takes a long time. I mean, it took me 30 days of doing it every day for an hour. 
sometimes multiple times to get to the point where I could do that. But my tactics trainer rating on chess.com went up like 400 points after doing that. And I believe I have a theory extending the method um, from Axel Smith who did this method and he was about my strength about 2200 feet a and he did this for a year and now he's a grandmaster and this has been like I want to say seven years since he published his book saying about his training methods um, the great thing about chess.com and their tactics trainer is that you have the ability to do random tactics and they all have different classifications so you can look at your statistics to see what type of tactics you typically get right a lot and what types of tactics you typically get wrong so then you can focus, you can get one of these simple tactics books that focus strictly on the area of your weakness. And I believe that's a great way to patch holes in your game, which I'm going to be the first person, you know, with this video to say that's, that is, in my opinion, the best way to study tactics. But I will say keep in mind an extension to that is, well, if I'm only playing the English and Sicilian and structures like that, I'm never going to need to know F7, F2 tactics because they're never going to occur in my games. And the majority of tactics problems occur from E4 games. So if I never reach typical E4 positions, probably 60 to 70% of tactics in books are completely useless for me to learn. So trying to figure out the tactics that are frequently occurring and positions and structures that are frequently occurring in your games are going to lead to a lot faster improvement. You're only studying the things you need to know versus the things that you don't need to know. And also think about how we learn another language. We first learn the most important words that we use on a regular basis, and then we branch out from there. So does the learning theory, as I'm adapting it, does that make sense to studying tactics in chess? Okay. Um, so let's go forward with this game. and. I look at this position and it feels like a King's Indian to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, the only structural difference between this and a King's Indian attack is typically the pawn's on c2 and this queen's still on d1 or something. So I, I don't have many qualms about how to play this position. I just know that I need to get some action done on the king side because the center's locked. So I want to look at moving this knight out of the way and playing f4 at some point. So. In this position, I start off with knight h4. He goes queen c7, and I don't want to play f4 immediately. I, I want to question the existence of this bishop. So if the bishop moves, I would love to play knight f5, and that's a great square for the knight, but I don't want his bishop to have the ability to take me. So I play h3, and then bishop e3. This gives me some flexibility to think about the idea of playing d4, and also with h3 being played, especially like Nick, you play the English. So typically, before you play bishop e3, you play h3 to stop knight g4 and any of that nonsense because you don't want to have to waste a tempo moving your bishop in an open position. You don't want to trade off your bishop. So rook fd8, rook ac1, a6. And here, this is where having knowledge of different tactical themes is important because I would say that this structure and this organization of pieces here is very similar and is seen in the Sicilian Night Orf. So understanding typical themes within the Night Orf, I looked at this position and the reason I lined up my rook with his queen is so when I played knight d5, if he takes with a pawn, I take back with the c pawn hitting his queen and his bishop, therefore I'm making progress. My opponent took no time here, captured, and then closed the position. Now, I know 100% that my only plan at this point is going to be on the king side because the center is completely locked. He's going to be expanding on the queen side, but he's hitting nothing but air. So the rest of this game, I would say white has a huge strategic advantage because he's traded off his good bishop. He's left with his bad bishop that can only defend, and I'm going to expand and attack on the king side. And all of this is from previous experience playing positions that are similar to King's Indians. So I haven't quite gotten to the, the end game part of how I recommend getting better. So let me go ahead and hit that before I go through the rest of the game. End games are relatively simple to study. But the problem with 
analyzing your games deeply in something like leechess.org or other things for end games is the engine is wrong on end games almost all the time. So even simple in game positions, you can let the engine run for a long time and the concept of the horizon effect occurs. The horizon effect is when a human looks at a position and say it's king and rook versus king and knight, we go, okay, in order to win this position, we're gonna have to get the knight away from the king or we're gonna have to have an exception scenario where he can't perpetual check us with the knight or he's not stalemating himself somehow. So we just try to visualize in our mind's eye a position to where an exception will occur where we'll be able to win the game. Does that point A to B thinking make sense with how humans problem solve things? The computer has no point B reference. So it has to see every single move, blunt force calculation to try to find it. And it can't most of the time. I can show you guys positions to where I can trick the engine and put, say, a king and an h-pawn, and then have an entire board full of light score bishops and a black king on h8. And at first, the computer will believe for a few seconds white is plus 99 and winning, but then it realizes that with all those extra light square bishops, you still can't ever promote the h-pawn into a queen, and then it reads all zeros. It takes it about three seconds, depending upon the engine and the software, to make that realization. It's kind of weird, right? So that principle applies. So how do you study in games? Well, when you're analyzing your own games, you hope that you have a table base that's strong enough. And you can look up table base. Just type in table base chess in Google. And we have solved chess up to, I think, eight pieces at this point. And you can put in any position with eight pieces or less, and it will show you perfect play for both sides and you have the ability to throw your own moves against the engine and it will play perfectly against you showing flawless execution. I think playing against the table base is the best way to get good at end games because there are countless end game books and I mean the main things you need to remember are rook and pawn end games make up one in three of all end games you'll ever have or rook minor piece versus rook minor piece like rook and knight versus rook and bishop so you need to understand knight and bishop dynamics and you need to be really good in rook and pawn in games and that makes up the bulk of all in games that you'll ever have to study so knowing those basic in game positions are important yeah is it eight on both sides or just eight eight in total yeah and that's including the king but i mean chess is complex so it takes a while so my recommendation is that if you're struggling with an in-game position, you can, they've got a feature in Lee Chess where you set up a position and you can play against the computer at, and always set it to its highest level. And then first you play against it on one side of the board, then you play against it on the other side of the board, and then you let the computer play against itself to try to see better play. And that way you can get some more ideas on how to play an in-game more effectively. Make sense? So I've gone through studying methods so far and how to do better in opening, middle game, and end game. So these are ideas over Christmas break on how you guys can be studying to get better. Because I'm not giving you any specific homework, but I will say that whoever in this room can prove that they've done the most work, whether it's playing more games than anybody else, doing more tactics than anybody else, showing that you learned all your lines that are in Lee Chess that are provided for you in your openings. If you can show definitively with all the different knowledge that I put out in front of you to learn, I'll pay whatever your next entry fee is. So if you got a big tournament you want to go to, say it's 75 to 100 bucks for the entry fee, you got it. So I'm going to make an active competition with you guys over Christmas break. We'll test as soon as you get back and we'll talk about new goals because we set goals for nationals at the beginning of the year. Let's set some more legit goals and start looking for tournaments and start getting some rating points in the second half of the year. All right, so finishing this off, I already talked about the plan. So kingside action, knight f5. Well, bishop f8, pretty straightforward. And I know pretty soon the guy's going to play g6, and I like the idea of playing g4 here. Not quite sure why in retrospect. It just felt nice. He goes g6. I'm like, okay, knight h6 check, bishop takes, bishop takes. And you're like, black's got a moral victory. He got to trade off this bad bishop. It didn't really help him, though. 
And the deal with this type of position and you guys need to understand, especially like the Sicilian con players in the room, if you ever trade off your dark square bishop, these are the types of problems you begin to have. Or if you're playing the Nimzo Indian and you don't put the pawn structure correctly, you're going to have these problems as well. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that he has nothing defending this knight. And that basically dictates the rest of the game. So b5, get the lady out of the way, get her ready to come over to where the action's going to be. Rook dc8 f4 he takes and a lot of people would hesitate to do this because you're like well you're going to give him the e5 square no if he goes knight e5 i take and then i have a protected pass pawn for the end game and plus knight e5 takes he just hangs a knight so his knights are already stuck together so he goes rook e8 so maybe he can get out of this okay queen f3 and when that e-pawn moved, it created another type of weakness. Very straightforward play. d4. And there we have our tactics. Overloading the position, and now the 2300 titled master's back breaks in the position. Knight c4. b3. No need to get in a hurry. He loses here. And it looks like he may get some kind of play. But we come back to the concept of the pinned piece and the knight being less than the bishop. So the best he can do is sacrifice. Check. Put your king on the safest square. He can't exactly move the pawns anymore. So now I threaten to play g5 to win his knight keeping pressure on the piece so it can't attack me. He stops g5, so now I come up with a secondary plan, remove the pawn to double rooks, and he'd had enough at this point and resigned. From start to finish, it's a pretty straightforward game, and it came from knowledge. I didn't have to think playing this type of game. And as we'll see in our other games in that we're going to analyze from Nationals, you guys had some great opening prep, but your execution wasn't this type of flawlessness. And how you get to that point is, I mean, a lot of people will go, well, I'm playing a lower rated player. You know, I'm 1,500. He's 1,000. He's just going to lose. Oh, is he now? Um, I make a game of it when I'm playing lower rated players, um, in all honesty. When I'm playing against them, I have full confidence that they're going to lose. And that's not arrogance. It's, I know I'm stronger. I know I'm training as a chess player. I know I'm a master. So when I'm playing a 1,600 to 2,000, I have full confidence that I'm going to win 100% of the time when I sit down. I know objectively and statistically that's not true, but I feel that way. Confidence helps. And from a secondary perspective, when you treat the game like I do when playing against a low-rated player, when I go over my game and I analyze every single tournament game I ever play deeply to try to find any flaw, I play a game when I'm at the board that if I feel myself getting lazy and being like, oh, I can just trade down and win, I get upset at myself at the board and try harder to find the best move, especially if I have time. If I'm low time, I just play chess. But if I have time to think, I'm always using my time to try to find the most accurate moves because I take pride in my games when I am over 65% accurate with a computer. Because most grandmasters in like game in 90, which is what I typically play, aren't going to hit over 55%. So if I'm like razor sharp accurate, I feel that I've played the best game that I can possibly play, and I'm very happy with that. So we have some goals over... Christmas break, and we have some study methods. So hopefully the person who asked for the video is satisfied. That's it.